<laughs> Good evening. Um, I think all of you watched the film, didn't you? Um, which is going to be perfect for the next hour or so. Um, Ruth, thanks very much for coming. Um, a quick, quick bio, but I'm sure you all know who Ruth is. Ruth is a two-time Olivia Award winner, Golden Globe winner, uh, and Tony and BAFTA nominated actress. She's best known for her portrayals of Mrs. Coulter in uh, His Dark Materials, Alison Bailey in The Affair, Alice Morgan in In Luther, and for her work on the London stage. Uh, she has also moved into production, serving as executive producer on the miniseries Mrs. Wilson. And True Things is her first feature film in which she was both producer and the lead role. True Things is out in cinema next month. Um, Ruth, thank you again for visiting us. This is a real pleasure. Um, and we've got a very interested audience uh, this evening. Um, this is an adaptation of the book True Things About Me by Deborah K. Davies. Yeah. Um, so what were your first impressions of the book? What interests you about it? Why did you take the project on? Um, I read the book about eight years ago. I was doing a play with Jude Law called Anna Christie, which is a Eugene O'Neill play. And he was being sent materials to produce. And he read this book and he said, I think there's something in this. Do you want to read it? And I read it and I loved it. And I thought what I loved about it was that it was a very um, subjective point of view on a female experience of these initial throes of a relationship. In the book, it's actually quite, gets quite violent, the, the relationship, and we veered off that in the de development of it. Um, but I love the humour, I love the subjectivity, I loved how uh, truthful it felt and raw and honest. And at that time, it was before I May Destroy You, it was before Fleabag, mm. so there weren't that many uh, depictions of women like that. Um, and that subjective, that honest. So I thought, actually, there's something really in this. It took a long time to make into the film, uh, as things often do. Um, but, yeah, that was a long process of development and working with the script with Harry. I was just about to ask about Harry. So how long did it take for you to convince uh, Harry that it was a good project? Or what, was the, what were the orders there? We started writing on it... We had a different writer first, called Molly, uh, Molly Davis, and... She did a really good job, but it didn't really still feel like a film, actually. It felt just... I mean, the book's written a bit like diary entries, so it still felt a little bit like that. And as soon as we invited Harry onto the project, and she had just... She was just about to shoot her first feature, which was Only You, which was BAFTA-nominated, so she hadn't done that yet. But she had a vision, and she understood the material in a way that I understood it. We connected over it, and... Um, she was brilliant, and she's a writer as well as director. So I put, we wanted someone who was going to start visualising it as she was writing it as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get on to Harry just a, in, in a bit, but um, and you, have you said this in other interviews that I've watched. You said that um, you found the book rather like reading a series of confessions. Yes. Um, so was Kate a relatable, accessible character for you? Yeah, I think so. I mean, she... It felt... Those initial, like we're saying, the initial throes of a relationship, of the uh, infatuation stage, when you fall for someone and it kind of takes over your whole body. And Harry always describes it a bit like Midsummer Night's Dream, mm. that this sort of magic dust of romance and you fall in love with a donkey and then it finally lifts and you realise it's a donkey, you know? But it's... Um, it's that idea of it takes over your whole body physically and emotionally, and you can, be, can become blind to what is the reality. So we were really interested in the sort of idea of projected romance and love and what you can... It's, a, it's sort of inspired by hope of what that relationship can be. Um, and I thought that was all over the book, and... I thought that was really a fascinating thing to dig into. I've been there. I've been blonde as well. I've been both those characters, you know? <laughs> so I, I've been the guy. I've been the person who isn't that interested and um, is sort of distant as well. So I think it's really relatable on both sides. It is um, definitely and obviously from, a, 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 from the perspective of Kate. So could, could, a, could a male have directed this, do you think? Do you think they would have been able to get into the, the, the message well enough. Interesting. Um, yes, I think that men and women can direct all sorts of stories. Um, I think what was really wonderful about working with Harry on this uh, initially was that we, 
we were in, a, we, ha we anecdoted a lot about both our experiences, about being a woman. I think what's particular about being a woman is the pressure and societal pressure of sort of having relationships of what you biologically are able to do, um, what the expectations around you are, and that also feeds into the film about what she thinks she should be doing at this stage in her life and what her mum wants her to do. And So, I mean, maybe a man would have taken a slightly different approach on that material. Um, he could still direct it. It's just we took, that, we took our particular view on it. Um, and we had a female DP as well, a female director of photography. So she's called Ashley. She's brilliant. And she sort of worked intuitively with me and with Harry, but she'd find, you can see how the movement of the lens is really feminine. Well, it's, it's very, it's beautiful and it moves with emotion, with the character. And she was finding things, very intimate things that I was doing or Tom was doing, um, which were character based, that you might not see in a static camera or you might not see from a long lens. And she would be going in there and getting that stuff. Um, and to have her on set, as another woman who had gone through all this too, it was, it was really liberating, actually, working with those two women telling this story. Had you, was this a new team? Or have you, had you worked with some of these people before? No, I'd not worked with any of them before. I'd worked with our producer, Tristan. He, um, I actually went to university with him. I went to Nottingham University, so uh, <laughs> not Cambridge. Um, but Tristan, this is our first thing that we've worked together since then. That was 20 years ago at uni. And he was in... We both uh, did acting on the local, you know, the theatre campus, uh, and he did video footage for um, a production of Macbeth that I was doing, playing Lady Macbeth in. And Carrie Cracknell, who's a theatre director, she directed it. So we had a really brilliant group of people during that time at Nottingham who were, have all gone into the industry. And this is the first time I've worked with Tristan, so it's great. Yeah, um, and this is the first feature film that you've produced. Yeah. Um, this was, parts of this were shot um, and interrupted during COVID. What was that like? Uh, it was really annoying. I mean, obviously, <laughs> it was really frustrating. We'd, done, we'd spent sort of seven years developing this film and then, you know, a week into filming, it got shut down for a pandemic. You're like, this is typical. Uh, <laughs> and I don't know, there was something amazing about it. We all, you, you can't do anything about it. There's no control, so... You just think, well, maybe one day, hopefully we'll get to finish it, but may not. But when we did get to finish it, when we did come back in September, the whole crew came back, all the actors were able to come back, and it felt, it felt amazing, actually, because at, still at that stage in September, we weren't sure whether we were ever going to get back to normality, yeah. Um, so it just felt a privilege to be able to come and finish it. Yeah. Um... And Tom came onto the set slightly later, didn't he? Well, Tom started in that first week, but he, was, he came onto set on the Friday, I think the last day of filming. Tom is blonde. Tom is blonde. And I done, we shot all the stuff inside the office. So actually it worked quite well, weirdly, because that's the depressing <laughs> um, <laughs> early stage of Kate's life. And it was without blonde. And he arrived on the last day. So we had one day of shooting with him. He was brilliant. I was like, ah, my scene partner, this is where the film starts. And then, of course, COVID ended it the next two hours later. But, um, yeah, when we came back, it was all the stuff with him. Um, I'm, I'm going to get onto the substance of the film in a second, but just one more question now. Uh, how tricky did you find playing Kate? I mean, for me, you are Alice from Luther. That's, <laughs> um, that was my um, first time I saw you. Um, so how, it, com compared to some of the other roles that you've done... Uh, and maybe Mrs. Wilson, how did this compare? I think because I spent eight years with Harry sort of talking about it and anecdoting, and it was quite inside me as a character, and I actually think a lot of the quirk of Kate is more me than Alice Morgan, for example, or even Alison Wilson. Like, actually, I think this part required me to be observed because it's so subjective. The camera's on me the whole time and I don't have to tell a story or narrate a story as a character. I just have to be watched because it's, it's, so, it's all about my every moment and thought. So actually, in some way, it was about being more me. 
than I'd ever done before. So I'd say it's more parts of maybe a younger version of me, but it's definitely more me than I've played. Did this come at a good time in your career, just on that last point? Do you think it came at a time where you could really do the role justice? Uh, yeah, probably. I mean, I, I think um, you're constantly evolving, and what's brilliant about acting, what's amazing about acting, I think, is that it does... Uh, you evolve as you evolve as a human being, or reflect in your work. You know, it's like you are. There's some essence of you as an actor that sh which remains, that always is watched, mm. that comes into every character you play, that you don't have any control over. But if you grow as a human being, that will reflect on the screen too. And so, yes, probably there's some part of me that feels at ease in my skin more now than I ever have done before, and so I can be observed easier and hopefully that will get better and as I get older or worse it depends what happens to me but um, I, I hope that that you know as an artist that you grow that reflects in the work too um, yeah let, let, let's get on to the film I'm going to try and draw some things out and then I'm going to open up because there's people with, who might like you to ask far better questions than me yeah. but um, you've said a lot that this is a universal film and I sort of wanted to work out what that meant. Um, in many ways, it's a very, very contemporary film. Um, it's, it's about love in the 21st century or dating in the 21st century. So there's it's fast sex, it's texting, all the sort of references are quite contemporary too. Mm. So I suppose my question is, what actually is universal about it? What, what's timeless? I think I meant universal when I said that, about that it's... Um it's not really about dating as such. It's more like human interaction, and it's about um, those kind of the, the desires and wants and expectations and needs of people, which is feeds into all relationships. So it's not necessarily about the communication as such as just like what it is that humans want and need and how they can be blind to or driven by expectation or driven by... Um, you know, what's around them. And actually that kind of... I mean, I always feel like this, in a relationship like this, I think men and women have both been on Kate, have been the character of Kate, or have been the character of Blonde. And I always think that someone like Kate, she doesn't really, she's using Blonde to work out who she is. You know, I, I always thought she's actually quite a strong, driven woman. She's at the centre of this piece. She is not passive, even though she appears it, because she's picking him, she's picking that relationship. She's, um, she finds his number, she pursues him. She, um, she ends the relationship when she feels it's done. So in a way, she is working herself out through him. And I think men do that as much as women. So that's why I mean by universal. In terms of like the dating in modern days, I don't know, you guys will tell me whether it's like, relates to you and your modern, like how people connect these days and, um, we didn't have, I didn't, I've never been on a dating app, so I've got no idea, but um, I think there is a sort of fast, I don't know, I mean, I think, I think it's, I had that experience and I wasn't on dating apps, so I kind of think that it's pretty universal in that way too. Yeah, I, I'm going to come back to the point about how much of an agent um, Kate is in this, but maybe I'll ask another question to try and draw out what I'm trying to get at. Um, so a lot of the film is about the appearance um, rather than the substance of yes. the feelings, a sort of like faux ram romanticism. Um, there's, a, there's a line when you're, you're at the party um, in Spain prior to the wedding, and Blonde says something like, you complete me, which I don't know if it's, if it's specifically taken from Jerry Maguire. But um, yeah, it all seems quite fake. So what's, what's real and concrete about true things? What's the thing that you can hold on to that, that really has substance? I think her feelings are real. I mean, I think that she feels... Uh, excited and overwhelmed, you know, I mean, the guy stimulates her and excites her, and all those feelings are real, it's just that she's projecting so much onto him of what the future of that potential relationship could be. Um, and so I sort of think it is, it's about projections, it's about idealisation, it's about... Um, like, and what drives sort of expectation or it's hope, 
isn't it? It's hope of something. And it's hope of connection. And it's hope of having something safe. I mean, she wants to be... We all want to be safe and feel safe in a relationship. So she's sort of feeling that is what she needs to do to be safe. And actually, it's not the answer. The answer is for her to go travelling, to get out, to go and try something else. It's not through this man that she's going to find her safety. But she has to explore it that way, or she's pushing for that. So I think it's... Um, yeah, it's about projection, but there's real, there's real feelings in there. I mean, I'm not denying that she has those real feelings. Um, well, well, what about the other way around? So um, you, another thing you've remarked on quite a lot is that um, Harry would spend time with you and Tom separately um, because mm -hmm. you had such different takes on the characters. Um, so you say that um, Kate's feelings are very, very real. Um, what about Blondes? I mean, I mean, does he actually love Kate, do you think? Harry would argue yes. So Harry argued... I mean, it was interesting in development of Blonde, the character, because he's objectified in some ways. He's called Blonde. He has no real name. We don't know his name. We don't know much about him. So it's really, again, through the eyes of Kate. So in some ways, you could say it's all through her visions. But in order for an actor to play that part and for Harry to also write that part, she wanted him to feel three-dimensional and not to be a caricature. Um, you wanted to believe that... Kate's love for him and why she would fall for this guy. Um, so you had to give him three-dimensionality. Um, and every actor wants that, and every writer wants that, and every audience member really wants that too. So in working with Blonde, it was about finding what his... She, she felt that he, did, he was in love with her, and she really... Um, I mean, actually, if you... And you watch the film, he's the only one that recognises how kind of quirky she is and recognises how funny she is and he sees the good things in her that other people don't um, and I think that he, she always felt that he just couldn't bear intimacy in some ways, he had a real issue with being close, even though he kind of was drawn to her so every time she got too close he kind of couldn't bear it um, so it's not that he doesn't didn't want to be with her, as he just, some, something in him found it quite uncomfortable. And that was about his own inability to be close to someone. Yeah, he's not, he's almost like not a evil character. Right. He's quite, um, well, probably quite relatable, as you said, yeah. we've been both Tom and yeah. um, Kate. Um, I, I've got bags more questions, but I'm going to open up at this stage um, to you guys. So, um, has anyone got a question for Ruth? Um, I love the movie so much. Oh, good. Um, and I think you're amazing. So, um, I was just going to ask, you were saying how, like, in relationships, you might kind of, whether that's consciously or subconsciously, yeah. choose to be with someone however long to almost, like, explore parts of yourself. Yeah. And I was wondering how much when you're picking the roles you want to do, and even with this project, how much it is about exploring perhaps, like, hidden parts of yourself or, like, kind of uglier sides of yourself that you kind of tend to hide away and what attracts you to a role really. That yeah, I, uh, you're probably right. I don't know, like, necessarily what attracts me or why I pick things when I do. I just... Um, but it's probably, yeah, I'm probably exploring something yeah. interest, like, something related to me. Um, I've been really interested... I was thinking recently some of the choices I've made whether it's like The Affair or it's His Dark Materials or it's this play I'm doing next, is that they're sort of also about psychology. They're kind of how you dramatise things in a different way. So The Affair is, is from two points of view. So it's his and her point of view on the same event. Um, his Dark Materials, I have... Part of my psychology is in a monkey, in a demon. Um, and in the, I'm doing the human voice, which is a cocteau monologue. And it's basically a woman having a phone conversation for an hour. But you don't know if there's anyone on the other end of the phone or not. So to me, there's also something fascinating in dramatisation of narratives in a different way and psychology of things, which are slightly... They're not linear. They're not normal storytelling. I, I get really interested in that. So I think it's a combination... And it's Constellations I did as well, which was a wonderful play... Um, about basically it's sliding doors, you know, the many, many different versions of one event. So I think I'm fascinated by that too. Um, 
internal sort of work, but also how you do things psychologically differently. Yeah. Um, from talking to other people, uh, one of the things that people seem to have differing like yeah. ideas of what happened was the bit with the dog. Um, oh, good. All right, good job. <laughs> Tell me, I've not heard this before. Go. And I was wondering if you could give any insight into that and also the bits of the film that you feel were real and the bits that were like hallucinations or dreams. What do people say about the dog? What are the different versions? Well, I, like, some people, I think, did get a bit of a bestiality representation. That's but, the literal version, but, yeah. But okay, I, just, nice uh, I, I thought it was a bit weird, but I, did, I, did, I definitely didn't think anything dodgy was happening. It was funny with the dreams because, um, you know, Harry always... We wanted the dreams to have, sort of tell a story in their own way and some way throughout as they go, and you can see they sort of get darker and weirder as it goes on, and there's the... And, um, and they always sort of help... In the editing, it was like they kind of seamlessly move from reality into dreams. So it kind of creates this psychological state that you're really subjective. You're inside her sort of psychological state. I think the, the dog... And look, I have to ask Harry, really, truly. Um, but I think it's about the se her sexuality. It's about sort of her facing her own sexuality or running away from it or being scared of it or the dog represents her sexuality in some way. Um, and it's... That's what it's about. It's like kind of face to face with herself, I think, in some ways. It's a beast. It's an animal, you know, that she doesn't really know how to control. Are there any characters that you've um, come across, whether real or in a book or in a play, that you'd really love to play? Um, I don't really. I mean, I, sometimes I come across things that I'm like, oh. Uh, yeah, there are some that I've got, and I'm developing them now, you know, as projects. Um, but I don't have, like, ultimate characters that I... <laughs> that I want to... Like, I don't... You know, it's not like, oh, I want to play Lady Macbeth, or I, I don't really have ultimate sort of things that I'm sort of aspiring to play. I think I tend to sort of try and... Well, I just keep open if something lands, like you said, and it's, it sort of hits me at a time when I'm interested... <laughs> then I'll go for it, if you sort of mean. I kind of don't... I've, I've been lucky enough, in a way, that I've had so many great things and parts that fascinate me that I... I don't know, that's enough to sort of go off. I don't know, that's not a very good answer, but you know, I don't really have characters. I've got one at the moment, which I hope we get it made, but it's a... It's a mob wife. <laughs> Imagine me, well, it sort of fits with my theme of characters, but... Um, she is. She was married to one of the biggest mob bosses in the U.S., and she was phenomenal. She was an amazing woman. That he killed her first husband in order to marry her, and then he. Um, she's called Anna Genovese, and she ended up opening two drag bars in the East Village, uh, and had a, a relationship with a woman for 30 years, and then took her husband to court in the 1950s. I mean, it was amazing. She was amazing. She was kind of. And it has been forgotten from history. So I quite like finding people in history that have never been talked about or found and actually telling their stories. Because there's so many brilliant women in history that haven't really... They haven't ever been recognised. They're the ones I'd go for. There you go. <laughs> um, was there a specific sort of moment for you in the film when you thought... You talked about the like, mist of romance. Was there a specific moment when you felt that it lifted or was it sort of gradually ground down... Sorry, so again, something romance? The it? sort of magic of the romance that kind of lifts at the end. Do you think there was a single point, or was it more gradual for you? Um, I think when you're in those sort of relationships, you probably, and I think we, we sort of try to get that in the film a bit, that the, you start to sense it a bit. But I always thought what was really interesting about the moment of the veil lifting is usually it's sort of quick. <laughs> you're like so in love with someone and you think they're amazing and then just something like their earlobe is really ugly <laughs> you're like oh what is their earlobe or oh, the back of their head or the way they walk suddenly you're like oh my and then it all changes <laughs> and it's instantaneous and you're like that is so we wanted to sort of find that moment so I think in Spain when she, when he first you know and she's it's a bad day the coke's gone everywhere you know he's He's turned up late, and she sees him, and he's in that outfit, and she's like, oh, my God, this guy is not what I thought he was. Um, but that's built from stuff before. It's just that I think you... 
I don't know what people, why people do that, but I've certainly done that before, <laughs> and I think it's quite common. Why did, why did she go to... I didn't really get why she went to Spain, to be honest. Because she... I don't think it's so about like one him. one last chance. Well, stuff. yes, but it's really about her own... She talks about wanting to go travelling. She talks about... Yeah wanting to get out and in a way it's like uh, he gives her and at, through, actually throughout the whole film he's giving her a way out even if it's dangerous or a bit like reckless it's a way out of the life that she's in and actually that's all she wants is to not be and she's in a way I always found that she was a character that had a, like creativity inside like it was something like she might have gone to art school and then never really followed it through and nothing really happened from it. And so she's found herself in a job that she hates and can't be creative and is sort of stifled. And then this guy is just a, lights her up and it's a way to destroy the life she's in and exit it. So I think partly she's not over him yet, but I think she thinks he's an exit somehow and he is an exit for her. Just for the next question, um, tied up in that is the the dance scene at the end. And I know yeah. you've spoken lots about that, but that looked quite fun to do. It was great. That's <laughs> Did you get pissed and just dance around? Before? No, no, no. Well, did I get pissed? May have got pissed. It was in Ramsgate. It wasn't in Spain, so which that wasn't... <laughs> so it wasn't as quite as fun as it looked. Um, and But it was the first time we'd all danced since COVID had happened. So I, it was great fun for me. I got to go in there and just let rip. <laughs> and we didn't quite know what we were going to do with that scene. Like, we didn't know how it was going to play out or... Um, we didn't know that we were going to splice it between me on my own and other people. That all came in the edit. And we, oh, on, in the, on the day, I was like, let's do it with everyone and let's do it on my own. So we can, again, keep in the psychology of uh, this character. But, yeah, dancing to PJ Harvey, brilliant. <laughs> So my question ties back a bit to the question about the um, scene with the dog. Yeah. Um, but as the dreams get more intense, um, and particularly the kind of earthquake one and that sort of turning point, it gets more and more difficult to distinguish between what is real and what is in her head. Mm -hmm. um, and I personally was, was struggling to tell, you know, the scenes where she's watching television with her parents or back in the pub uh -huh. with her friend. You, I, it seemed to me you, you're not quite sure whether that's actually something that's happening or whether it's a flashback or whether it's mm -hmm. how she wants things to be. Um, and essentially, I'm wondering, firstly, are those meant to be real? Is that meant to be what's happening? And secondly, um, um, how purposeful was that kind of blurring? How? Well, um, as in, am I just not getting it, or is that how it was meant I, to be? No, I think that I, I think the whole film is, it's about the heady experience of being inside when it overtakes. You know, I, I haven't been like this for a while, but I have been like it before. Um, you know, but the, the sort of overtaking of every waking mind, every waking thought, if you're, if you're infatuated with someone, that kind of takes over everything. So I think it, there is a bit of messiness to it. They're supposed to be real, those moments. Those moments are supposed to be um, that she's with her parents, she's back in the same, the kitchen, go around the kitchen showroom with her parents, with her friends. Her life has gone back to, uh, or it hasn't moved on, it's the same. And she's trying to, sort of fit back in. Um, and so it was a, I, it's the idea of, like, without him, she goes back to the life as it was, and it hasn't changed. So she needs to break free of that. So the Spain thing is like... So they were supposed to be real, um, but the idea of it being muddy and slightly lost in her own mind at that point is kind of the point. Hiya. Um, so... A running theme through the film seems to be like loneliness and acceptance of that or finding joy in it. Um, so do you think the experience of the pandemic has changed the way that audiences uh, are going to be impacted by the film? Um, interesting question. I don't know. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, I've been pretty lonely during some of this COVID. And I've had also spent a lot of time with someone that I didn't want to spend that much time with. Um, so, do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, God, this is, like, difficult in both ways. But, um, yeah, I think that... Uh, I don't know. I, I hope so. I think people have understood or had to learn to be with themselves um, and had to learn or 
or with others, um, but they've had to learn to sort of exist in their own space without the usual things that they, that they can distract themselves, they like can go out or get drunk or whatever else. They've had to kind of try and exist with their own brain, and that's really difficult. <laughs> and, um, and I think that is what the film is saying a bit, is that this character is... She is in her own imagination a lot and in her own brain, and that can be overwhelming. Um, and she'll probably take a lifetime to be able to deal with that. I, I don't imagine her being free at the end. I imagine her going and meeting another man and doing exactly the same thing, personally. I sort of think that she is off on her... She will eventually learn or change, but she'll probably make the mistake, same mistake a few more times. Um, thanks ever so much for coming. Uh, one aspect of the film that I thought was excellent was the sound design. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? Particularly in how it drifted between kind of a lucid dream state and reality. Yeah. I'd be really interested to hear about that. Also, you talk about in the fair the use of the kind of the his and the her role. Mm. Obviously, this film's very subjective, but to what extent did you explore what one was actually doing? Because you're kind of left guessing his thought and his process. And if so, would you be interested in producing another film from... Blonde's point of view. That would be quite interesting. Quite cool. Um... Uh, the sound design, yes, we had, thank you for that, I loved the sound design too, and he's a, he'd done a play that I did a few years ago, he's a brilliant sound designer um, called Alex Baranowski, and we actually had a musician who was going to do the sound design initially, uh, and compose the music, but actually it was, she hadn't done a um, composition for film before, and it's a really, it's a really particular job, because you have to tell a story with your music, it's not just you as a musician putting your music out there, you have to use your music to tell a story and tell a narrative and enhance or pull away or support the narrative. Um, and we found on this job, with every part of this film, it was always about being truly subjective to Kate's experience. So rather than, for example, in the um, car park scene when they first have se sex, and initially the sound designer was scoring music that was quite dark and making it feel scary. And, and we were like, nah, she's having a great time. So actually, the music should be lighter and match what's going on in her head. We as an audience would be like, what the fuck are you doing? You know, like, so if you give a... We actually found that the music, if we stick it with Kate, it will cause a sort of conflict for the audience as well, which is interesting. Um, and I also, yeah, and he, he's brilliant. I loved the playfulness of the music as well as it goes on. And that, for me, was reflective, again, of Kate's imagination. Uh, I thought she, it would be quite quirky. She doesn't really take herself that seriously. And so the music, it's almost like she's playing her own film in her head, you know, some of it. Um, and then the blonde, yeah, that's a really good idea. I'd sort of be really interested to think about who that man is and how he exists and why he's like who he is. Uh, and Tom did such a brilliant job of making that character three-dimensional and making him mysterious and truthful. You know, there's one scene which we had, which you mentioned about Harry and I and everyone having different opinions of what he was doing. There's a scene uh, when I wake up and he's in the kitchen and he's looking for food. And Harry was like, Tom's like, I'm sure he's looking for drugs or something. I'm sure he's drugs or money. He's going to nick something. That was Tom's thing. And Harry's like, no, he's just looking for food. <laughs> but Harry, like, Tom was like, no, no, I'm looking for drugs. So anyway, he, he'd kind of come up with his own, you know, lots of layers. And he, had this, he kept doing this as a character because he, whenever he said something emotional or something that he felt the character, he, he would do this. So he, in his own way, he had dev gave his character lots of different traits and nuance. Um, that came onto the screen and made him really intriguing, you know? Makes you want to make a film about him. Um, do you have a specific process that you go through, or do you kind of play it by ear and change each time? And if so, is there a moment in that process where you kind of think, oh, yes, I finally get them, I finally understand them, or is it always kind of a slight uncertainty there? Uh, the pro I... I used to have a really strong specific process because I think I was just scared. So I would like stick to my sort of, I had like workbooks. I did history at uni, so I was very sort of, it was all about 
I don't know, writing things down and research. And um, I still enjoy that part of it, actually. Research is one of my favorite parts of like working on a project. But I think I've, I've obviously got more confident in, um, in that things will come. And in the doing of it is sort of where you discover stuff, too. Um, the most interesting characters you never understand. It's a header I never understood. And, but I loved playing her. And it didn't really matter that I didn't understand it. It was kind of, I was just present in each scene. As long as I knew what I was doing to the other person in that scene, it didn't matter, I didn't understand the full, you know? Um, and actually it made it quite electric, I think, to play and to watch. So that taught me something. I didn't have to know everything to perform it. Um, and there was one time that I did a job where I felt so uncomfortable playing it. I didn't feel like I was... The director wasn't happy with what I was doing. It's actually one of my better performances, even though I was, the whole time, feeling incredibly self-conscious. So it's always... It's such, an in, it's such a mysterious job to me, and that's why I love doing it, because I can never really full, fully be in control of it, even though I try. <laughs> uh, and I'm letting go of trying these days, which is good. But um, so I think it's, yeah, it's a mystery. Well, to me anyway. I, I think I was going to ask something similar to Aria, but um, I was just wondering, because you said the psychology is really important for character and obviously for Kate, it's one of the more relatable roles you've played. Um, and just thinking about the kind of roles you have played, is that, do you think it's possible to play a role without finding something you necessarily relate to in the character? Have you ever had to? Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think there's... Um, I mean, this is culture, I don't <laughs> really... I mean, I, mean uh, I... I think it's like, it's not necessarily that you, you... I mean, I think it's about empathy, right? You have to understand people. I always think that... We can't have art without empathy. You really can't. You have to be able to live in other, step into other people's shoes and try and see the world through their eyes and try to imagine, use your imagination. Um, and so there's lots of parts I've played which I, I don't really understand, or, but it, I do the process of trying to understand it. And that's when you were saying about, is there a moment when you go, ah, there are sometimes moments like that. And I go, Ah, okay, I've connected. For example, I went to when I was in Streetcar Named Desire and I was playing Stella, and I did go to New Orleans for a research trip, which was fun. Uh, probably the best 10 days of my life. Um, no blondes there, but, you know. Um, and I, there was a time that I met someone, and he was a Tennessee Williams sort of expert, and he was talking about the ports being... New Orleans Port being like the place where loads of trade was happening, so loads of new work was starting there. And it was Stella that actually left her Belle Rev, which is like, a, you know, countryside, down into the port. And I suddenly thought, oh, that's interesting. She's never depicted as someone that's the driving force of change. She's the one that left home. She's the one that went for work. She's the one that found New America, which is Stanley. Stanley's New America. And she is the driving force. So actually... She's pivotal in this whole relationship. And because of Marlon Brando and because of Vivian Lee, the character of Stella's always been slightly dismissed. But actually, she's the fulcrum. She's the kind of pivotal... So that was, aha, she's not a, she's not a sort of wilting flower. She's the one that's saving, surviving, and saving the family name, in a way. Uh, I have another one, but I can't tell you, actually, because I'll probably get in trouble, so I'm going to say that. <laughs> but, I have, but there's moments where I do connect with, like, aha, OK, now I can understand it, or I can see the lens of this through a certain avenue. And it's lovely when that happens, because then you, it, it does become clear. Yeah, just on that, um, Phoebe at the back has watched this the first time with me on Wednesday, and we said something similar um, about Kate, which is that... Um, the, she's the agent. All the sort of development in the narrative and the progression of the story comes from Kate. And so um, it's not the fact that her parents rock up with food and stuff. It's not really blonde at all that gets her to change or develop. It, it all comes internally. 
And I don't know if that was something that attracted you to the role or something you're looking for now when you portray similar characters. I just think people are agents of change themselves. I mean, it's, it's up to you. I always feel like, yes, you, you choose to be in those scenarios. I mean, OK, you can, ask, you can have a big debate about whether we have choice in our life, really, at the end of the day. But I think that, you know, it's... Every individual has the choice. It is the kind of is choice of their life or how their life goes in a way, or how they choose to what they, who they choose to be with, or how they, you know. So I sort of feel like that's interesting. Everyone's responsible. Mm. To me, everyone's responsible. Like in the affair, it's like what I loved about that is that it is about who is responsible for this affair, and then one person blames the other person. It's like actually everyone's responsible, and you are responsible for your own actions and what you. Uh, so that's what I think this film's about. It's like she is responsible for making the change in her life. Um, I think it's really interesting how um, you say that Kate is um, not a victim. And I just wonder if you mm. think that the ideal of a strong heroine in film and TV is changing or whether these characters have always been there and we've just not recognised their sort of strength. It's a really interesting question, because I think that, you know, typical messy women are often quite loud and front-footed and confident and loudly messy, in a way. What I loved about Kate is that she's sort of seemingly really shy and quiet, and she has this inner sort of strength and desire, which, and actually inner creativity, which has been untapped, and she's sort of underestimated by everyone. Apart from Blonde, you know, he's the one that sort of actually identifies something interesting in her. And so I think that's different. Like, I sort of feel that women, strong women, are like front foot, like Mrs. Coulter, strong woman, you know, like, and, or Alice Morgan. But actually, you're like these other, I think, women are extraordinary characters, well, humans are extraordinary characters. And you have to sort of look for the sort of duality in all people, and I, that's what I find quite interesting with her, is that she seems passive, she seems quiet and shy, but actually she's, she knows what she wants, or she's, she's driven, you know? Um, so that thought, that's quite rare to see, actually, I think, um, on the screen. We like seeing really bolshy, loud, confident women, and actually it was quite nice seeing someone who's a bit quieter. So I, it's an interesting question, because I think I would like to see more of that. Um, I think it's more truthful, actually. But you know, it's not popular. <laughs> no, just go there first. You've had your hand up, Rachel. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I thought the film was really honest um, and straight, straight in its emotion. Um, I just wondered if there are any films in this genre um, that really inspire you or that you know, you've watched in the last few years. Um, a film I can think of is, is The Souvenir, also mm. starring Tom Burke, um, where, you know, you sort of have a central character who's sort of struggling to find themselves and going on a bit of a personal journey. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, also the male character has got flaws to him and those flaws are revealed throughout the film. So I was just wondering, could you, yeah, could you think of a, a film uh, that is really honest in oh, that Oh, interesting. Um... <laughs> I don't know, in terms of this genre, I would say, have you, anyone you seen Drive My Car yet? And this is this year. I mean, I, I mean, it's a recent film, but I have to say it's one of the best films I've seen because it's, it's profound, you know, and it's about, it's incredibly honest. It's like watching a great novel on screen. It's three hours, so prepare yourself. But um, I, I was really moved by its... Uh, I don't know, it, just, it was really truthful and honest and about human, the, the, the breadth of human life, of how long your life is and how many different chapters are in your life and just how profound it is to be a human, actually. So it's not the same genre. Well, it's, a, well, it's an individual struggling with their life. There you go. There's lots of those films. But that's, I would go and see that. Thank you so much for coming. It was, I really enjoyed the film. It was great to watch on a Friday afternoon as well. <laughs> um, at the beginning, you mentioned that in the book there was a kind of violent aspect to the relationship. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could expand on kind of why you chose not to include that 
was it to make the message kind of more subjective and subtle in that respect or yeah it was interesting because the film or the book goes into really quite dark territory like the cheese gets physically abused by him um and it's it's pretty brutal and i think it's uh, we all decided that we thought there's a more universal story to be told there's yes there's a story about Sexual, sexual abuse but, and violent physical abuse. But we wanted, we were kind of, there's a more, intre- I don't know, we're more fascinated by that sort of initial throes of relationship and the kind of complexity of obsession. And that felt sort of more interesting to us, actually, or just slightly, it's where we, we wanted to, what we wanted to develop and concentrate on. It would be a totally different film if it was about um, physical abuse in a relationship. And I think we were, you know, even though it's been interesting because some of the sort of critical um, reviews of it have mentioned sort of gaslighting and an abusive relationship. And I mean, it, I, I'm sort of questioned whether it's an abusive relationship because I think it's like, it feels like ghosting. It feels like he is bad. Yeah, he's, a, he's badly behaved. Um, but it's, it's really about her relationship to that or whatever that, you know, and... Um, her interaction with that relationship. So it's, we veered away from the, yeah, physical abuse side. It just would be a different film entirely. You say it'd be a completely different film entirely. So is the, is the sentiment or the message that you're left with at the end of the book mm. very different from what you get left with at the end of this film? Well, it's interesting, because in the book, she kills him. So she puts a pillow over his head and kills him. And um, yes. so, yeah, and I... But I always... I, again, always read it a bit like that was a metaphor, a bit like, you know, the films have got all these dreams. I always slightly... I interpreted that a bit as her killing off the thing that was destroying her. Yeah. Um, and there was a... There was still a suggestion, even in our film, that we have a dream-like scene where she kills him. But it was like he hasn't done enough bad stuff, to, in a way. It's not like it's... He's, he's pretty horrific, but he's not... Um, physically abusive like in the book so it it sort of didn't have the same stakes Um, so yeah it does end in a different place yeah Uh, not sort of the nitpicky technical stuff but are there any other substantive changes from the book that like you you comment on was it pretty true to the it's pretty true I think the in the book we actually cut a lot out in the edit so the process of edit is really fascinating and it's a Second time I've been in an edit, but it's a really interesting time where you really make the story. And we, in the book, he has, uh, he has a fat, he has two kids in the book. And we didn't have him have kids in the film, but we had him have a, oh, yes, you see him through, you see a woman, don't you, in the house? So we do have that still. Um, but there was a bit more in the book of him having like a family that she sort of sees. And it, so it's a bit more obvious that he's, really dodgy (laughs) or he's playing around and he's like abusive and I think we just wanted to make that a little bit less obvious so that was kind of the connection between the two of them was more it was more I don't know tangible you had more affection for her or sympathy for her if it's hard it would be quite hard to sort of understand I don't know you have to dig deeper into understand why Kate was with him um if you saw that stuff so we we realised it was going to make it a hard sell, actually, you know. So one character that we didn't really get to explore much was her friend from mm-hmm. the beginning, and I kind of found myself questioning whether she was a real friend with her best interests at heart, or <laughs> was she kind of a part of the reason why her life before Blonde was so oppressive? Exactly. That was a very good question. We had a really good debate like a, a after this film like a month ago or something. And it was so interesting because someone asked a similar question. Or they, they said they wanted to see more of her and they thought she was like the guiding light and why wasn't she in it more? And she was in it more actually, but again, we, in editing, you end up sort of narrowing the story. Um, but it was so interesting because someone sat next to her and was like, no, she was like, I found her really smug. <laughs> <laughs> and she obviously didn't have her best interest in heart, so, uh, uh, you know, at heart. So um, I always think, I always felt that they weren't very good friends, that it was something, it was a friend that you've had for years or known, but actually you've grown apart or actually, you, you know, 
and I, I find this in my life, is that you, as you work out who you are more, you realise some of the friendships don't work alongside that anymore. And it felt a bit like that, that they sort of have been friends, they've known each other for a while. Um, but actually their dynamic is not particularly healthy for Kay or for Alison, actually. It's sort of set in old tram lines. And she's stuck in that dynamic with her friend. So she plays, she's open, like even at her opening the door, her friend's setting up like dates for her. And I had Kate opening the door to Alison, you know. It's like, it's sort of like her friend, the Queen Bee Alison, is setting up her life for her. And actually, she's a bit oppressed by it. So you're right, that's, that's what we wanted to get across with that character. Um, the worst scenes of me like going around and babysitting, you know, and like ugh, having to put up with her kids and things like that, who are lovely, but <laughs> they got taken out again because we have to narrow the film. But um, it was a sense that that friendship wasn't really. I don't think she'd go back. Kate wouldn't go back, and then they might keep reconnect in a few years. But I think it's not. It's something that would take a few years to reignite. And actually, we did have Alison her relationship not being as happy as she makes out. So that was the idea. You spoke <laughs> about how you were, like, like your process for, like, finding the role, for example, but I was just wondering how something, like, with the role of Kate, for example, where it was, like, kind of cooking for seven years, did you say it? And mm. how have you found that, or how do you find it in general, letting go of a role or a project? Is that something that you kind of find quite hard or is it like you just kind of get through it and then it's like on to the next one I find letting go really easy actually weirdly it's not um yeah I don't I enjoy some characters I play and sometimes you think oh I like for example Hedda I was like I could have done a bit more of that I could have done a few another month or two months of performing that because I loved it and I didn't quite still understand it I think I love the creation of a character. I love um, how scary that is and not knowing what you're doing and, you know, making a fool of yourself or all this. Like, I, I love the sort of how scary that all is um, and what it inspires in you. When I have to keep doing a character, I start to get a little bit... Not, it's not bored. It's like I just don't... I sort of need new stimulation. Um... So I find it quite easy to let go of characters in a way. But I've always been, I've always found it quite easy to let go, yeah. strangely. <laughs> so. Um, I thought it was really interesting what you were saying about kind of looking into the psychology of characters. Just wondered, um, in terms of the process of kind of getting into that psychology, how that might differ if at all, um, whether you're performing a character on stage or in a film, whether it's to do with the chronology of kind of making that um, piece of work, does that have any impact on how you um, kind of uncover the psychology of a character? They both have a technical aspect. So um, I don't go method on things because it's tiresome and <laughs> um, I don't know if it necessarily helps all the time sometimes. I think, to me, sometimes method is about focus. It's about maintaining a form of focus because... Essentially, you're pretending to be someone else. <laughs> so it's, it feels like uh, quite, it could be quite embarrassing. You know, like you're in front of a lot of people doing something. So I think that method and all those things are tools to help you focus and to keep zoned in to something um, because the ability to be self-conscious is huge. I think that... Um, when you're on stage and film, there's a, there's a technique, there's technical stuff that helps. And uh, so you talk about psychology. I will work, when I'm processing and working a character out, I would often think about the psychology as a way in or I think, what is it? Like Mrs. Coulter, she's a narcissist, right? She's a real narcissist. So in that first few episodes, it was like when when Lyra goes against her, she's really hurt. She's really upset, it like really hurts her. It's like she's emotionally hurt by that. Um, and how dare she? You know, it's like, doesn't, can't compute around that. So she's a deep narcissist. Um, but there's technique that you bring into camera work that's about how do you 
perform this in a way, uh, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that you can go to a level of psychology, but also then you have to be technical. I mean, in theatre, for example, you have a live audience, and you can't deny the live audience. You can hear them. You know when they're with you and they're not. You know when you have them. So it's like there's a level of performance. You've got to use your voice. You've got to do certain things. So I think you can't be pure psychology on that, if you see what I mean. You have to go with the words and with the rhythm, and it's much more musical, and it, you know, it's a lot more to it than just psychology. That helps you, but it, it's only one part of the whole performance, I suppose. The, the answer, that answers it, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. kind of seminal recent things within this genre and obviously one of the reasons why they've become so renowned is like the approach to intimacy. Yeah. Um, and obviously like the whole the whole point of this um, this film is like this objective lens on the case. Like, I was just wondering how did you approach intimacy as like as a as a crew? Did you have something specific in mind? Like did you draw off um, kind of changes that have happened like, back and, and destroy you? In intimacy as in what do you mean intimacy? Um, as in like kind of intimate scenes. Sex scenes. Um, yeah, I mean I think I've had to do a lot of sex scenes in my career and um, they're sort of it's interesting because I think there has been previous to Me Too and Time's Up and the discussions around it, they weren't people weren't talking about them. They just pretend they weren't happening. Actors, agents, directors, casting directors, everyone. So it just became awkward by the fact that everyone was so awkward about it. <laughs> like, and, it and it's, you know, at best it was awkward, at worst it could be quite exploitative because people weren't having the honest conversations about what was happening in the scene, what they wanted from the scene, what they'd like to get, you know, what the intention of the scene was, how best to get that. Um, and treat, not really treating everyone as adults, you know, slightly in, being awkwardly embarrassed about it. Um, what Me Too and Time's Up has done is meant that conversations have to be had. Everyone has to now talk about it. And it's about being aware of your own comfort, you know, where you feel comfortable when you don't, and how the other actor feels. And also, okay, how are we going to... What, what does the director want from the scene? What are we really saying with the scene? And I think it makes people much more specific about sex scenes in general. Why, do, why are they on there? And what are they saying? And every sex scene should have as much of a journey as every other scene in the piece. They shouldn't just be there for titillation. There should be some reason why they exist. And sex is a part of everyday lives, so they should be. We should have them. It's just you've got to be as specific with them as everything else. So, and then I think they're going to be much more interesting and much more intimate and much more honest as a result. So I think we're in an interesting place with things like that. Um, I think as long as people keep having the discussions and accept sex as something in our everyday life that's not shameful, then we, we can move forward and progress on it. But, you know, it's good. It's getting better. <laughs> sex is good. Uh, <laughs> that's the answer. Uh, anyway. <laughs> um. End it there. I've got one more. <laughs> I've got one more question. I don't know if any because we're probably running out of time here. So we'll do two more questions. Just one, one here. Um, speaking of this changing culture in film and TV and this changing portrayal of women, um, would you ever consider directing, or is this something that you're doing through your producing as well as your acting? Yeah, I, I, I think it's got to be the right. I'm always someone that, uh, when an opportunity comes, I'll just jump at it, I'm not very good at long, necessarily long-term planning something. Like, I, I directed a play once. I did a three Eugene O'Neill shorts. Um, that was about six years ago. And I loved it. And it, in a similar way, the reason I loved it was because I got to work with all the collaboratives, uh, all the creators um, in a collaborative way. So I got to work with the composer or with the writer. Or, and so, for me, yes... I want to do more of that, and whether that's producing or ends up directing, we'll see. I don't know. One thing I probably won't be as a writer, I can't see myself really sitting down and ever putting pen to paper. Um, there's people that are very good at that, I'm not. Um, but maybe directing, yeah. We'll see. Um, 
I suppose my last question is slightly corny, but um, we are next to the ADC Theatre. I told you the, um, just earlier that there's a theatre production um, oh, yes. here next week, and then in the audience you've got most of the main people from the dramatic. Are you guys in and, it? Are you, um, some of you in it? Performing well, the, in it? One of the executives is there. Uh-huh. Um, but so I, I suppose my question is, what was your sort of student yeah. acting life like at Nottingham, and have you got any advice for anyone here? Uh, I did more acting than history at Nottingham. I mean, I definitely spent most of my time in the society. And it was where I decided to go into acting, definitely. I, I'd always had an inkling, but I didn't, I didn't admit it to anyone. <laughs> um, so I went to uni and I found like-minded people. And we had a whale of a time. I directed, I acted, I produced. We took a play to Edinburgh Festival. We took a play to Off-Broadway. Off it was one of the best times of my life. And it was then that I decided to go into acting and go and audition at drama school. Um, so, yeah, it was definitely the sort of turning point in my decision to go into acting. And I think, like, you, this is your time when you're not critically observed. You know, it don't, there's, no, there's no sort of stakes in a way. Um, so enjoy and explore and use all the tools you have here and the opportunities you have here to sort of do what you want, direct, act, try it all out. Because once you get in professionally, then it's a bit more, the stakes feel higher. <laughs> so do it now and like enjoy it and explore it. Um, that's my advice. Um, Ruth, thank you so much for coming up. Uh, can we give Ruth a round of applause, please? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.